Thank you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Border carbon adjustment. Madam Deputy Speaker, it may not trip off the tongue, but this is not a dull subject. This is policy that is the stuff that dreams are made of. Imagine, if you will, as you settle down in your bed. You start to wonder how you could create the economic environment for levelling up in our manufacturing heartlands, giving them a low carbon head start on the rest of the world. And as you turn over and you start to count the fluffy sheep as they jump over a fence, you catch sight of a free market which naturally seeks out the most effective way to reach carbon net zero and deliver on the Prime Minister's 10-point plan. And finally, just as you drift off to sleep, you glimpse, as in a glass darkly, a government leading the world at COP26, achieving an international approach that brings cooperation and rapprochement with our European and American friends and allies. Could this be real, or must it evermore remain but a dream? Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, this is no dream. We can turn it into reality with a border carbon adjustment. We know we need to reduce carbon to net zero by 2050, and centuries of experience have taught us that the free market is without example in being able to solve challenging economic problems such as this. And yet, right now, our free market is standing helplessly by its creativity and innovation useless because I would with pleasure. Well, Deputy Speaker, thank the Honourable Gentleman for giving way uh, and commend him for bringing this forward as well. And he's right about the Prime Minister's uh, statement in relation to environmental issues. But does the Honourable Member not agree that we now have the potential to make a real and lasting change for the better by implementing environmental changes? And yet we also have to be aware that the pressure on businesses must allow them to continue to operate and not put them out of business. There is a balance, I believe, to be got. We have an obligation to the industry, but also to the environment to get it right. Madam Deputy Speaker, the Honourable Member is entirely right, and that is one of the great benefits of a border adjustment, because it allows you to raise domestic costs without being unfairly undercut by international um, imports coming in. So uh, you can square the circle. You can support the environment by setting a carbon price which is sufficient to change people's behaviour, to make lower carbon products more attractive in the economy than higher carbon um, higher carbon products, and yet at the same time uh, facilitate the high, the, your, your domestic industry to remain competitive. And so it is because we cannot price carbon emissions that our market is currently floundering. And the reason why is because they're an externality. When I produce a piece of paper like this, I take account of the cost of the, uh, the uh, ingredients for the paper, the energy that I'm going to use. I take account of my overheads, my uh, marketing spend, my transport and my distribution costs, and also my profit. But in the free market exchange with my purchaser, currently the cost to society of the emission of carbon through that manufacturing process is not accounted for because it's dissipated into the environment and we can't put a price on it. And that is why we have market failure on the, cost, on, the, on the price of carbon. So what does the government do to try and deal with this market failure? Well, it's left in a very difficult position. It tries to change behaviour by announcing reduction in targets, by making piecemeal regulations and as, when, as and when they become available, and also by picking innovation winners. And we've got a, a list most recently of hydrogen and, uh, and modular new nuclear uh, to name but two. And I very much hope that the government has got these expensive choices right. And based on the available evidence, I believe that it has. But that, Madam Deputy Speaker, is the point. Only a properly functioning market finds the best way to allocate capital with its invisible use of the combined knowledge of the sum of all the participants in that market. No government can match that combined wisdom. Our current approach to carbon pricing simply doesn't work. If we raise the cost of energy with our higher cost of carbon, our industry simply becomes uncompetitive, as uh, my, the Honourable Member for Strangford uh, pointed out a moment ago. Manufacturing simply moves abroad. 
or it goes bust, and its place is taken by the raft of imports from higher carbon countries added onto the very high cost of carbon in the uh, import process in transport. Countries like China. And the result is damaging to jobs, it's damaging, of course, to our business, it's very damaging to our balance of trade, it's very damaging to our tax base, and of course it is damaging to the climate. All in all, a damaging disaster. Border carbon adjustment can transform this process. Charge imports from a high carbon economy the same carbon cost as we impose on our domestic industry via a BCA, and the problem is solved. There would be no incentive for our manufacturers to base production abo abroad since the costs would be equalised. Foreign companies would no longer have an unfair trade advantage. In fact, it would provide them with a direct incentive to reduce carbon usage in their domestic environment in order to avoid corrective tariffs. And from a policy perspective, that I'm, I'm using China as an example, the Chinese government would have a choice. Either its exports pay a carbon price at our border and the money goes to our exchequer, or they create a carbon price in their domestic market and they get to keep the money themselves. So there is a really positive incentive internationally for uh, carbon reduction and the benefits to be spread. Because after all, climate change knows no borders. And better still, using the same calculation for border carbon adjustment, but this time in reverse, our own factories would get the benefit of a carbon cost rebate at the border when they export, making their exports both cheaper and more profitable, increasing our competitiveness already on the international market. And there, are, there are many ways that you can skin this particular cat, Madam Deputy Speaker. You can either design a system whereby all products coming in or out of uh, the, the United Kingdom have their carbon uh, contribution assessed, or if that is considered to be too complex, we can take baby steps. We can start off by applying a BCA towards the five or six most uh, carbon intensive industries and then take it from there. So you would start with steel and fertilizer and petrochemicals and aluminium and also with energy. And I'm just gonna take two examples from that list uh, by, by way of, of explanation. So first of all, with steel, an independent research project has been undertaken to assess the impact of a border uh, adjustment tariff uh, on the steel industry. And its conclusions were that were we to implement a BCA in the United Kingdom, that would increase the competitiveness of UK steel against many of its international competitors, at the same time as raising for the Treasury a, a tax windfall of between 270 and 850 million pounds if that carbon price was set at between 50 and 75 well, pounds a ton. With great pleasure. I'm glad that he's making an incredibly sophisticated argument. Um, on the subject of international competition, can he tell us what other countries are doing? For example, are the EU considering something on the climate? Well, my learned friend has anticipated a point of my speech in a few minutes, but he is absolutely <laughs> right that just in July this year, Madam Deputy Speaker, the European Union uh, started a formal consultation on the implementation of the border, border, uh, border carbon adjustment process uh, for the entire uh, European Union. And it's not just there, but you'll have to wait a moment or two before I come <laughs> on to the other exciting news that I have for you. <laughs> So let's look at steel. We can get a huge amount of tax benefit plus increased competition that will give a, a benefit, a competitive, a fair competitive, competitive advantage to our domestic steel. Yes, I will repeat. I commend the Honourable Member on his uh, campaign for uh, uh, carbon border adjustment payments, which make absolute sense, and there's no uh, <coughs> reason why uh, people who aren't green uh, get a competitive advantage on those countries that are uh, leading in the uh, uh, battle to become carbon neutral. My, my question is really a slightly more technical one, which is uh, we've got a very complex economy. How do you actually work out which uh, products need border adjustment payments and which ones don't? Or do you just focus on one key industry or do you try and do it across the whole board? I, I thank my honourable friend for his intervention. The answer is there, there are many different ways that you could approach it. 
the simplest would be to choose the five or six key heavy car carbon heavy industries and start with them. And then as you've got more, more knowledge of how to un implement this kind of scheme, then you would spread out to the wider economy. And, and I s suggest that the best way to do this would be to look at the carbon emitting credentials of the energy market in the third country and assess in broad terms what their, their carbon contribution is. So for example, in China, the coal contribution to their energy mix is between 70 and 80%. And you would use that as their basis for the carbon contribution of, of their, um, their imports. Uh, and then when you get a bit more sophisticated, you could start giving where individual uh, businesses could demonstrate that they had a low carbon approach despite the high carbon attitude of their country as a whole, perhaps you could give them rebates. So it would benefit behavior and would not be protectionist, but would merely be a fair assessment of the carbon cost of transactions. Moving on to energy, Madam Deputy Speaker, we naturally assume that we, cr we create all the energy that we use in this country domestically, but that's not in fact the case. On average, we import via undersea interconnectors about 7% of the electricity that we use in this country. And you may recall that last May, we trumpeted in the press that we had a two-week period where we were coal-free. We had coal-free electricity for two weeks. And this was, this was very exciting. Um, but what the newspapers failed to mention was during that, that two-week period, we imported from Holland 40 gigawatts of coal fire generated electricity. And the reason why we did that was not because we lacked generating capacity in the United Kingdom. It's because it was cheaper to import coal fired electricity from mainland Europe than it was to use our own. And the reason why it was cheaper was because it was entirely tax free. Whereas we imposed a carbon tax on the generation of our own domestic electricity. So unbelievably, we actually incentivized the importation of high carbon coal generated electricity at the expense of our domestic manufacturing processes. How can that be right? And a border carbon adjustment would sort that out in a jiffy. So what single better way is there to forward this government's leveling up agenda than by putting in place the economic conditions for the market to want to re-industrialize in the UK, and all of that with no need for government subsidies. In fact, not only does it not require government subsidies, it will actually produce an annual windfall for the, windfall for the Treasury year after year. Now, working out how big that windfall might be is, uh, has a number of imponderables in it, but the, uh, the Grantham Institute for Environmental Science has produced a report on this, and again, using the assessment of a, a carbon price between 50 and 75 pounds a tonne, starting in 2020 and working up towards 2030, they assessed that the gross amount that the Treasury could recover as, under this process would max out at 36.7 billion pounds a year. Now, I stress that is the gross amount you may well take the view that rather like VAT, this is a tax which is consumer-based and would impact poorer households um, disproportionately as a percentage of their gross income. So the government might very well want to use some of that £36.7 billion to cushion the blow and to make it more uh, uh, acceptable for lower-income families, perhaps by investing in uh, insulation for their houses or other, <coughs> or other measures. Could but I refer to where? Yes, of course. Thank you for giving away. Uh, you're making a fascinating uh, speech here. Despite starting off talking about uh, sheep, um, you've kept, I think, everybody's uh, enthusiasm all the way through. But um, a lot of uh, emissions-intensive British industries are already going to find it difficult to compete in the global marketplace. And as we begin to encourage the use of carbon capture and clean hydrogen by heavy industry, they will face higher costs of production. Would a border carbon adjustment enable heavy industry to decarbonise while preventing jobs being lost? And would this be something the Treasury would also find attractive? Well, my, my honourable friend has put, uh, hit the nail absolutely on the head. That is one of the key benefits of a border carbon adjustment, is it allows us to decarbonise. It allows our heavy industry to accept the pain of higher 
energy costs and therefore letting the market work in our domestic market to incentivize the development of lower carbon technology, whilst at the same time protecting it from being undercut by countries which are taking a little bit longer to go on the low carbon journey. So we're not going to be spending money, we're going to be making money. And that money can be used as the Treasury knows best. It doesn't need, mean that that money is taken out of the economy because it can be put straight back in by the, by the Treasury. Uh, I hope in productivity enhancing tax cuts, but it will be up to them. And best of all, leaving the best till last, by freeing up the ability to price domestic carbon emissions at a realistic behavior changing level, we can unleash the magic of the free market to seek out the most efficient solutions to low carbon production. You don't need the government to pick winners and subsidize industry once a market is working properly. Yeah. Give a price to carbon that is, and that is exactly what you create, a many headed monster of innovation, entrepreneurialism, dynamism, and efficient productive capital growing our low carbon future. This future, Madam Deputy Speaker, if we're brave enough to embrace it before other nations rather than just following, if we're bold enough to allow the reshaping of our economy by demand rather than by direction, we will equip our industry as leaders in low carbon manufacturing. And they'll be leaders because they will be swimming in their natural element, whereas their international competitors will still be struggling to react to the short-term government green initiatives and schemes that we all currently suffer from. And it's a lead that can generate exports and growth in this country. So what's stopping us? What's stopping us from delivering on the Prime Minister's vision of a low-carbon, dynamic economy? Well, some worry about a protectionism challenge at the WTO. But with a BCA applied in an open and transparent manner, Nothing can be further from the truth. This is a policy that is about creating fair comp competition, removing unfair competition, not the other way around. And in any event, WTO rules expressly allow for tariffs whose purpose is to protect human, animal or plant life and health or to conserve exhaustible natural resources. Those are two exceptions, two exceptions tailor-made for this kind of tariff. And more practically, if the UK were to join with the United States of America and with our friends the European Union and other countries to establish the principle of BCAs at COP26, then that's a game changer because that would ensure their practical acceptance. Others worry about putting forward such an ambitious proposal at COP26. They, they feel that it runs the risk of failing to achieve the consensus that allows the PR men to claim a stunning success. And it might. But the risk of failure is the price of ambition. So, should we give up on our ambition? Of course not. Jenkin. Um, I have no doubt that he's right about the application of WTO rules, but what happens if there is a, a free trade agreement already in place? Does the free trade agreement have to be renegotiated? Um, supposing we have a free trade agreement with the EU and we want to to put a carbon tariff on German steel, which is very carbon intensive, um, are, are we going to be tied in knots by what we might have already agreed? How, how, how does he think that will be resolved? Well, I, I thank my honourable friend for his intervention. And the example that he gives, that of Germany, uh, would fill, uh, fall neatly into the European Union, which is itself uh, consulting on this very issue. So in that case, it would be a coalition of the willing. Uh, to allow us to go forward, I, I hope, with a, a form of um, equality between the European ETS, uh, Emissions Trading Scheme, or its successor, and the approach that we would take ourselves. But uh, that would be up to country-by-country uh, -country negotiations, I accept that. So, is there international support for this approach? Do we have a realistic prospect of, of bringing the world community together and with us at COP26? I say there is, because President-elect Biden has already spoken about, and I quote, carbon adjustment fees 
against countries that are failing to meet their climate and environmental obligations. This is a clear indicator that the incoming administration in America is taking this seriously, and I know there's many a slip between a statement of intent and action, but this is something which we can potentially get behind at COP26. And the European Union, as has already been mentioned, just this July has, has uh, launched a formal consultation on the implementation of a border carbon adjustment. And it's worth noting that the President of the Commission, I think it was part of her manifesto when she was first appointed, that this is one of her key objectives for um, her presidency. I will again. And, and the commentum on this uh, absolutely fascinating speech. On this, it's clearly good to try and get global cooperation on this, as a coalition of the willing, as you put it, amongst as many countries and trading partners as possible. Um, if we do fail to do that, do you think the UK should go on its own, or would that be just too difficult and put us too much out on a limb in the global trading system? Well, I thank my honourable friend. I say we go it alone. I think it's one of the it's one of the great freedoms that we have from Brexit, is that. If we've taken the trouble to get our independence, what use is it if we're not prepared to use it, if we're too scared yeah. to use our independence yeah. to make a bold statement and say, this is the right thing to do, we're going to do it, follow us if you like. With great pleasure. Delighted to, to hear the depth with which he's exploring this subject, and, and I think it's fascinating what he's been saying. Um, does he agree, though, that if it's about the right thing to do, then the first thing we must do is to stop the subsidies that currently go and the tax concessions that currently go to carbon industries um, domestically. And that it only makes sense as part of a whole package if we do that. The Honourable Member recognises that we're on a journey in our decarbonisation of industry. And I'll be delighted if I manage to persuade the Minister to accept this one element of the policy without uh, rewriting the entire economic agenda for um, the next period. But it's, 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 it's clearly true that over time we will be moving away from petrochemicals and the need for subsidising what will soon become stranded assets uh, becomes less and less uh, clear as to why, what the economic case, the business case for doing that would be. Our hosting of COP26 would be the perfect forum, Madam Deputy Speaker, to crystallise these disparate movements which we've already identified around the world into a coherent whole. What better objective for the conference could there be? Politics is full of missteps and compromise. Very rarely do the stars align in favour of a truly inspiring act of political and economic leadership, one that can transform the future of our country and the world for the better. Madam Deputy Speaker, the stars are aligning for border carbon adjustments, if only the government will believe in the Prime Minister's vision of a post-Brexit Britain and be bold. Minister Kwasi Kwarteng. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. I thought it was a compelling and uh, fascinating speech that my honourable friend uh, gave, and he elucidated many of the uh, technical difficulties associated uh, with imposing uh, unilaterally, as he uh, was arguing, uh, a carbon emissions, well, a carbon uh, border tax. And um, I think that my honourable friend, the member for South Cambridgeshire, actually hit the nail on the head when he asked, uh, should we do this unilaterally? Um, and I'm going to start by saying that, in my view and in the government's view, um, this is a very, very important subject, but it has to be treated as part of a multilateral effort. Um, people might well ask, uh, we are responsible for, I think, 1% of uh, carbon emissions and if we, globally, and if we impose a tax unilaterally on carbon coming into the, or carbon produced products, um, carbon emitting products coming into this country, um, we may well be disadvantaging our own consumers if others around the world are not placing the tax. Uh, so as far as the government is concerned, we feel that multilateral uh, cooperation in this subject uh, is by far the best way to prevent uh, carbon leakage. The other thing I would say uh, to my honourable friend is that uh, by focusing on carbon emissions, he's really discussing 
the very thorny issue of carbon accounting. Because ultimately, um, the intellectual problem or the, the difficulty of um, accounting for carbon uh, is the broader problem, um, whether the carbon is produced abroad or at home. And in that respect, I would like to refer to him, I'd like to refer him to what my right honourable friend, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, said uh, in his announcement in this uh, very chamber uh, a little more than a month ago, where he announced, and I'm proud uh, that he announced this, that the UK will become the first G20 country to make TCFD-aligned climate-related financial disclosures uh, fully mandatory across the economy. So I don't think, and I'm not, sure, I'm not saying he said this, but I'm not, I don't think it's right to say that we're somehow laggards in this whole issue of, of carbon accounting. And in fact, um, I would say that we are taking a leadership uh, role uh, in this very subject. He alluded to the fact that the EU are looking at how they can implement uh, carbon, uh, a, a carbon um, import uh, regime, if you like, a tax on carbon uh, emitting uh, products coming into the EU. And this is something that we are absolutely engaged with them uh, in discussing. Uh, and we feel, again, that that's part of the multilateral approach. I would suggest to him that if he takes a broad view of uh, this subject internationally, um, 2020 has seen far greater progress than any other previous year. Only a couple of months ago, we had the Chinese government pledging itself to a net zero tar uh, carbon target uh, in 2060. And that's in incredibly significant because I remember when I first was appointed to the job, uh, someone said to me, it doesn't make any difference what we do in the United Kingdom if China continues along the path uh, that, it, it, that, it, that it does. Well, I'm very pleased to say that China has changed uh, its path. It's said very clearly that they have a net zero uh, target for 2060. The Japanese uh, followed suit uh, very soon afterwards and, and, and have adopted our target of 2050, as have the South Koreans. So the, um, the auspices, if you like, for international cooperation on uh, the measure that he has described are actually very good. And I think there is a chance that if we can't reach an agreement at COP26 next November, we may well be advancing um, in the not-too-distant future along the lines that he suggested. But I, I have to stress that I think multilateral cooperation uh, about how we price carbon, how we account for carbon in the round, uh, is, is far more constructive than uh, placing a unilateral um, uh, 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 tax in the way that he's described. And of course, one of the other things I would say about um, the, the figures that he very ably quoted in terms of the benefits of the Treasury, there are obviously going to be behavioural impacts. So it, it seems very difficult to me to, mod, uh, to model what the consumer demand would be for um, products which have been taxed in the way that he's, in the way that he's described. Um, so I'd be very interested to have a conversation with him about some of the assumptions behind the analysis that he very ably referred to in his uh, excellent speech. Absolutely happy. To say. It's grateful. He said something um, which I regard as very significant, which is, yes, we're going to try and achieve a multilateral approach at the COP, but that if we don't succeed at the COP, then we will um, consider a, a more unilateral, unilateral approach. And I'm bound to say that at this particular juncture, when the le term level playing field is so commonly spoken about in, a certain, in respect of a certain negotiation, surely a distortion of international competition is that some countries are doing their best to deal with climate change and other countries are exploiting uh, those efforts. And that, if that isn't a distortion of genuine free trade, I don't know what is. Yeah, yeah. And I think the unilateral approach is justified. Yeah. Yeah. Minister. The... I mean, this is a, an interesting uh, debate. I mean, what, what uh, he is suggesting is that a unilateral approach uh, punishing other countries, I mean, that's effectively what you're doing for not adopting the climate change um, agenda might work. Um, but as, as I've, I've had to say, forgive me, Madam Deputy Speaker, um, as I've had to say uh, repeatedly, I think that a multilateral approach is the best way forward. And I'm, I, I think there is an open debate about the effectiveness of a unilateral approach when every other country in the world um, would not be disadvantaging these products. I'm grateful to the Minister. Um, 
does he recognise that at the moment, ten and a half billion pounds is what our treasury uses as subsidy, public money goes as subsidy to fossil fuels in this country. More than any other country in the EU, um, it, it, which the average is about six and a half. Um, and therefore, if we are going to go down the route as suggested by the Honourable Gentleman and, and colleagues opposite, then it's absolutely important that the UK shows good faith and is not punishing other countries for what it is doing worse itself. So to punish those countries for the, the carbon encapsulated in their industries while subsidising our own industries, our own fossil fuel industries, more than all of the rest, would seem rather ridiculous. I think the Honourable Gentleman makes a fair point. And I think this is exactly what I was trying to say with regard to TCFDs. We've got to look at carbon accounting and carbon pricing in the round. It's a global market, and we have to look at what we're doing in terms of uh, discouraging uh, carbon-emitting uh, behaviour in, in the wider context of um, international trade. And I think that's a, fair, that's a fair point. Will he speak with the Chancellor about how we can reduce the subsidies to fossil fuels in this country domestically so that some of the, the innovative ideas that the Honourable Gentleman has put forward this evening might be taken forward, <laughs> might be taken forward uh, with credibility. Just, I was respectfully pointing out to my Honourable Friend that he cannot intervene on an intervention, but I'm very happy, I'm very happy to take up the point. And, of course, I discuss with my Right Honourable Friend, the Chancellor, all the time about how we can uh, capture... Uh, carbon accounting uh, more effectively in order to pursue the goal that we, we, all, we all seek, which is a net zero, uh, a net zero uh, world and it's certainly a net zero uh, British economy. But I wanted to refer to, to my honourable friend. I, I have uh, to make progress uh, here now. I just feel that um, ahead, ahead of, um, ahead of, uh, ahead of, uh, indeed, indeed, um, ahead of COP26, obviously all of these issues. As the Honourable Gentleman has mentioned, we have to look at carbon accounting in the round. We have to look at um, how we are reducing uh, uh, incentives for carbon emitting activity here in the UK, also in the context of the imported uh, carbon uh, that we, that we uh, bring in uh, from other countries. All of these issues have to be addressed in the round. What I wanted to say, and I have said uh, very clearly, is that we are le actual leaders uh, in this subject. We are actually uh, driving ahead uh, mandatory TCFD uh, financial disclosures. Uh, there are no other countries in the, G20, in the G20 that have done this. We passed the Climate Change uh, uh, Act, the, the Net Zero Act, uh, last year. Again, uh, we are waiting for other countries, even though they've made public statements uh, supporting uh, this policy, they have yet to enshrine it in their, uh, in their legal codes. So we are showing leadership. We intend fully uh, to, sh uh, to continue showing uh, leadership and providing that sort of uh, steer in the COP26 uh, conference uh, in Glasgow. Very happy to give way. So to the Minister, he has repeatedly said that the best way to proceed is by multilateral agreement. And I, I absolutely agree with the Minister when he says that. And it's so wonderful that we've got COP26 coming up just next year, which is the perfect opportunity to show multilateral leadership. So will the Minister commit to the House that we will make border carbon adjustments a core a core objective of COP26. Um, it's not in my power to, uh, make, to uh, make that commitment to the House. As he knows, I'm not the uh, COP26 uh, president, and that's something that I would suggest a question he uh, directs to my right honourable friend, uh, the business, uh, the Bayes uh, secretary, who is indeed the president of COP26. But I can assure him that this issue is absolutely at the centre of the wider debate uh, about climate change. About, it's at the centre of uh, what I may call international energy diplomacy, and I'm sure it'll be something that will be discussed uh, very seriously at the COP26 next year. Madam Deputy Speaker, absolutely. I'm extremely grateful, but I just want to put something on the record. The, um, the Honourable Gentleman opposite quoted a £10 billion subsidy figure for fossil fuels. Uh, will he confirm that the government doesn't accept that figure? It's based on things like the fact that we only charge 5% on domestic fuel of VAT instead of 20%, and it's typical of the EU to regard um, a low tax to help poorer households afford their fuel bills as a subsidy 
And one of the reasons we're leaving the European Union is they put out rubbish propaganda like this. We don't subsidise our fossil fuels, and I hope you will make that clear. You're right. And, and the idea that somehow we are the laggards in this subject uh, seems pretty extraordinary for the honourable gentleman to say this. Uh, when we look at uh, the country such as Germany, which um, has, is only fo fo phasing out its coal uh, dependency in 2038, um, I think it's a bit extraordinary that members uh, opposite uh, make the claim that somehow that we are the laggards. We're very much the leaders uh, in this uh, uh, arena, and I think my honourable friend was quite right. I'm not going to take any more interventions, uh, I'm, I'm afraid. Um, I think my honourable friend was quite right in pointing this out. As, we, as has been demonstrated very ably by my honourable friend, the member for Broadlands, um, this is a fascinating subject, and it's one in which uh, we'll, it will continue to exercise uh, you know, many minds uh, and, and much passion. And I think there's no other more serious subject, in fact, that can be debated here, and I commend him uh, very much for bringing this uh, subject to our attention, for debating uh, in a very open and, and uh, dare I say, friendly way um, this, uh, this subject and in actually giving a, a, one, of the, one of the best speeches I've heard this Parliament uh, from the backbenchers in terms of the thoroughness with which he presented uh, his uh, material and the passion uh, with which he stated his arguments.